everybody and welcome. When I visited ESA's Ready for the Moon conference in Vienna, I had the chance to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with astronaut reserve member Carmen Posnick, who is from Austria, like me. Since there were lots of media people on location, I only had roughly six minutes, so this interview is a lot shorter than I would have liked. You can even see the ESA communications person tapping me on the back to tell me my time is up. Before we start, I need to explain something. During one of the questions, I mentioned three names most of you are probably not familiar with. Franz Fiebeck, who was the first and so far only Austrian that went to space, visiting the Mir space station in 1991. Clemens Lothaler, who was his alternate, doing the same training as Fiebeck, but never flying. And Karl Nehammer, Austria's chancellor and therefore head of government, who held a short speech at the event. So, now that you're prepared, here is the full interview. Carmen Posnick, a uh, pleasure to finally meet you. So, you're a reserve astronaut. What does a reserve astronaut actually do all the time? <laughs> so, um, we basically stay in our old jobs. Um, as you know, ESA has selected five new career astronauts and ten reserves and one para-astronaut. Um, so, the five new career astronauts, they've started their training a month ago. And for them, um, the next, uh, basically their first mission is fixed. So, ESA has five missions to give away. Um, so, that's why five careers. And for us reserve astronauts, it's um, basically we do do um, uh, small events like this today. Um, we do briefings um, several times a year. Uh, we keep up our medical certification every year. And then as soon as there is another mission available, we get called by ESA and we start our training. Okay. So you haven't been on the zero-G flight or anything? Yet? I actually have been on yeah. the zero-G flight just last week and it was oh. wonderful. I was doing a, a biking experiment for the, um, the Cologne Sports University. Ah, okay. But that was not from ESA directly, it was from the university? It was the research team there that invited me, since I am also a researcher, to do, take a part ah, in, their, in their study. Yeah. Speaking of research, I read up that you uh, already s was, were researching in uh, space medicine before you joined the astronaut corps. If you get the chance to fly to space, what would be one of your pet projects or one of your favorite things you would like to experiment on the ISS or at the moon? I think the most, for me, the most exciting thing about uh, space medicine at the moment is this change that we see in the eyes of astronauts. So this has been quite a recent phenomenon that um, we noticed that astronauts get far sighted while in space. And we don't know um, whether this is an ongoing process or whether it stops at some point and um, and uh, well, they, they just see a little bit worse than before or whether if they go to Mars, for example, for eight months weightlessness, in the end they, they have deteriorated so much that they can't really see what they are landing anymore. So this is an important thing to find out, I think. It's changes in the anatomy of the eye and we don't really know the mechanism behind. So at the moment we're trying to find out what's the mechanism and how can we work against it. So this, I think, is what I would be looking at. <laughs> Look, sounds fascinating. I only get farsighted from age. <laughs> uh, so, we talked about uh, you being just, sorry, don't want to demean it, no, uh, it just, just a reserve <laughs> astronaut. Uh, seeing that we don't have that much launch capability in Europe and also the, the seats are very limited for Artemis and future, future projects and the ISS is going to be uh, decommissioned at the end of the decade. Do you feel more like Clemens Lothaler, the Austrian that trained and never flew, or more like Franz Fieberg, as Karl Nehammer uh, said today? I'm very optimistic and I wish to follow in uh, Franz's footsteps, of course. Um, I think it all depends on the next few years, because space, of course, is, uh, um, there's a lot of, hap lot of new things happening in space at the moment. And Europe might decide that, yes, they want a crewed spaceship that, is, that will bring bring astronauts to low Earth orbit and maybe one, one day also to the Moon or Mars. And in that case, of course, there will be a lot of new missions available. And I think the ISS, yes, is going to be deorbited, but several parts of it will be um, made into smaller stations. And maybe, maybe if you're very lucky, there might be a small European station amongst those. And then in combination with a spaceship out of Europe that can join this station, there will be a lot of opportunities for European astronauts and collaboration with international astronauts. So in that case, I think, yes, I can be optimistic <laughs> to be able to fly. 
there is a chance. There is always a chance. <laughs> right. So now there are uh, five uh, five main members of the 2022 class. There are the res reserve members. Then there are the astronaut core from before. Do you guys have some like a WhatsApp group or something where you keep in contact? Is yeah. there contact between you as a group? Is yeah, there like some course. team building going of on? Of course, there's a, there's a lot of team building going on. I've, like the, the series Chief Flight I was doing last week, I was doing it together with uh, Amelie, who is a German mm -hmm. reserve astronaut. And we do have a very active WhatsApp group where we keep each other updated on the latest news and some things that happen in space, of course, that some of us hear. And mm -hmm. so everybody is informed. And we also meet up to visit each other. And I think it's really a great group it's a big support so, sounds great so you were for, for more than a year in Antarctica if you see uh, the public perception of isolation because Antarctica you already have to you can't survive on the outside without protective gear M more so on the ISS or anywhere else in space what do you think in the public perception that people uh, misunderstand or underestimate from being confined for such a long time in such a space with danger outside? For me, I think it was mostly um, the fact that we all changed a lot. So we were 13 people for this year um, and we had, didn't really know each other before. We were kind of uh, selected for our, um, for our jobs, for our technical skills. And then we were stuck together in this tin can for over a year. And I think the, the most difficult thing was to keep up the team spirit, so the team cohesion, to make sure that, well, first of all, every single one of us felt okay and was in a, in a good place, but at the same time that the team functions. And it's quite hard to always have to put the needs of the team first before your own. And I think um, this was the greatest challenge, really, to keep, to whenever there was a conflict, to, well, try to avoid it in the first place, but then always talk to each other, talk everything out to be able to, yeah, to, because you still have to live together for the rest of the mission, of course, and of course you need to, the mission to be a success in the, in the best case. So I think this is, this is what most of us underestimated in the beginning, that it would be hard. Would you, if, if you would fly to space, would you be willing or would you look forward to going on a spacewalk? Oh, of course, yeah, that would be the highlight, I think, just floating in space. And one final question, just one second. Have you ever heard of or ever played the PC game Kerbal Space Program? No, I haven't. No, you haven't. Okay. Thanks anyway. <laughs> Carmen, it was a pleasure. Good pleasure luck to, to meet you as well. Okay, that was the interview. While Carmen Posnick didn't know Kerbal Space Program, she asked me afterwards how to spell it and was looking it up. So maybe she will have experienced a few couple of rapid unplanned disassemblies when I see her the next time. If I see her the next time. On that note, I have to say a big thank you to Isa for making this interview possible and an even bigger thank you to Carmen Posnick, who showed great patience toward the flood of reporters and this annoying guy in particular. I would have loved to also chat with para-astronaut John McFall and ESA Director General Josef Aschbacher, both of which were available for interviews. Unfortunately, there was not enough time to make that happen. Maybe another day. But another fellow space YouTuber managed to get Josef Aschbacher in front of the camera, Sirvan from Mars Chroniken. So go and subscribe to his channel if you speak German, because unlike me, he produces content in his native tongue. He was even so nice and filmed me when I asked a question during the press conference, but my camera's autofocus was not cooperating, unfortunately. So, best of luck to Carmen Posnick and the rest of the astronaut reserve that European politicians get their ducks in a row and provide ESA with the mandate and money to get more astronauts into space and trigger the European space revolution I talked about in the previous video. Please go and check that out after this one, link is in the description, it's sort of a companion piece to the interview. Also, if you like this type of content, please let YouTube's algorithm know by liking and sharing the video and leaving a comment. And if you generally like what I'm doing on this channel, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon or hop over onto my Discord server. Links to both are in the description. I hope you were able to take something away from this much too short interview. I personally learned some new things. And that's always great. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.